the insistence upon trouble and suffering as an intrinsic element of human experience so you could say we could concentrate on subjective experience what's your life like to you, how do you experience it and we could say, well, built into that is trouble built into that is chaos, built into that is anxiety and pain and disease and, and that you can fall prey to those things without there being something wrong with you now, you know, if you pin down a psychoanalyst like Jung or Freud they would, of course, admit that human misery is endemic to human experience but Freud, in particular, tend to look, tended to look for adult psychopathology in childhood misadventure, in childhood, in pathological childhood experience and he, at least implicitly, claimed that if you hadn't experienced childhood trauma and you had developed properly, that what would happen is that you would end up healthy, roughly speaking, certainly mentally sound but the existentialists, they don't really buy that perspective right from the beginning they, they basically make a different claim, which is that life is so full of intrinsic misery, let's say but suffering is a better way of thinking about it suffering that, that manifests itself as a consequence of your intrinsic vulnerability that psychopathology is built into the human experience there's no real way of avoiding it or at least, there's no reason to look for extra causes that might be a better way of thinking about it and you'd be surprised how often that sort of observation is useful for, for clinical clients, for example because one of the things that's quite characteristic about people especially if they're introverted and they don't have very many friends they don't have people to talk to if they're suffering, maybe they're depressed or anxious or they have some sets of strange symptoms like agoraphobia or obsessive compulsive disorder one of the things they always presume that is that the fact that they're suffering in that manner means that there's something not only something wrong with them but something uniquely wrong with them so that it's their fault and no one else is like them and one of the things you do as a diagnostician you know you'll hear a lot of rattling about how labeling is bad for people and certainly mislabeling is bad for people and even an accurate label can be a box that you can't get out of but it's very very frequently the case that if you diagnose someone it's a relief to them like you can't believe because they come in to see you knowing that something isn't going properly but they think well they're the only person facing it and that means they're idiosyncratically strange in some incomprehensible way that no one else could possibly understand and there's no way they could ever get better and one of the things you do is point out to them is like yeah, depression and anxiety doesn't really require any explanation right, there's plenty of reason I don't remember who said it everyone has sufficient justification for suicide I think that was the claim well, but the, the, the point is, is that if you look through the experiences of the typical person unless they're very, very fortunate and, and they won't be that way forever, that's certainly the case that they can point to traumatic experiences in their life death and loss and illness and, and humiliation and all those sorts of things that are sufficient to account for existence in a state of quasi-permanent negative emotion now, often if you see, as I said, if you see people who are depressed and anxious by nature they assume that everyone else is the smiling face that you see on Facebook and so that that alienates them from other people and themselves even more than, 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 than certainly far more than necessary and part of the psychoeducation that goes along with therapy is merely educating people to understand that a fair bit of misery is the norm and that there's plenty of genuine reason for it and so the existentialists basically start from that stance um, it's like a fall of man stance in some sense, you know, because deeply rooted in, 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 in the, the Western tradition, roughly speaking, is the idea that people are divorced from some early paradisal state and that it was the emergence of something like self-consciousness that produced that demolition of humanity and left us in a damaged state and, um, I mean, people think they don't believe that, but they believe it all the time um, and it's frequently how people experience themselves, you know, as, as if there's something wrong that needs to be rectified and it seems unique in some sense to human beings, it doesn't seem all that obvious that animals think that way 
But people definitely think that way. And so, all the existentialists basically take that as a given. And then they, they, they offer another question, which is, well, given that that's your lot, and that there's ample reason for misery, how is it that you should conduct yourself? Because merely, say, giving in to that misery, or multiplying it, doesn't seem to be It doesn't seem to do anything but multiply it. It doesn't seem to do anything but increase it. Now, so if it's bad to begin with, you might say, well, increasing it is definitely going to be... Increasing it is something that you have to regard as worse. So how do you conduct yourself in the face of misery? Okay, so how do they, how do they present that to begin with? Well, this is from Pascal. And, and this is a, an existential statement that describes the position of the individual in the universe, you might say, or... or or you could say that it, it explains the individ, the, the deep, a deep characteristic of individual experience or existence, hence ex existentialism. When I consider the brief span of my life, swallowed up in the eternity before and behind it, the small space that I fill or, or even see, engulfed in the infinite immensity of spaces which I know not, and which know not me, I am afraid, and wonder to see myself here rather than there. For there is no reason why I should be here rather than there, or now rather than then. And so, that's an element of existential thinking that is shared with the phenomenologists called thrownness. And that's a term that Heidegger originated, if I remember correctly. And what it means is, is, it's an analysis of a certain characteristic of human experience, which is that, well, there was an, an immense span of time in which you could have been born, but you weren't born then, you were born 20 years ago. And there was an immense span of time in the future that you could have been born, and you weren't born then either, you were born when you were born, and you're who you are, and you have exactly the characteristics that you have. And there's something tremendously arbitrary about that. It's as if you were thrown into experience, and that's what thrownness means. It means that you were randomly placed in a place and time. And there's something fundamentally irrational about that, meaning that there's no real way of understanding it. It's something you have to deal with. And you might say, well, why was I born poor? Or why was I born less attractive than I might be? Or, or why was I born less intelligent than I might be? Or maybe why, I was bo why was I born to these terrible parents at this particular horrible moment in time? And in some sense, there's no answer to questions like that. It's just how it is. And you have to deal with it. <laughs> 